Hello everyone, welcome to my shop. I'm Robin. Today I'm going to be showing you an autocollimator mirror system that I have uh, made for uh, measuring the flatness of surface plates. But first we need to discuss an autocollimator enough that you can understand the principles of uh, how it works. An autocollimator simply shoots a crosshair image out to a reflective mirror. The image bounces back into the autocollimator and inside you can read and see what that angular change is. And uh, it doesn't matter where the starting point is within reason, it only measures the change in angle of the mirror. So we're measuring, in the case for measuring vertical straightness like you would be measuring for a surface plate, we're only concerned about tilts this way. Uh, if you have a, um, if you need to measure something where you're measuring straightness on the side of something, like a straight edge laying flat on the plate, and you want to measure it uninfluenced by gravity in the one plane, you can rest these feet against it, and it's going to measure angular change this way. But for surface plate work, we're only interested in the vertical. An important thing to remember is that an autocollimator is can only measure straightness. It cannot measure flatness by itself, but you can construct multiple lines, and by using the proper techniques, you can connect those multiple lines to each other and determine flatness from that. So that's, I think, something that confuses some people. Um, it is actually a, a straightness measuring tool, and we're going to put multiple lines of straightness together mathematically to determine flatness. The key thing to realize about an autocollimator is the reading is to totally uninfluenced by distance. This has no effect on the angular reading, as does this has no effect on the angular reading. It purely only responds to change in angle from wherever you zeroed it. Here's an image through the viewfinder. The very blurry image you see on the upper right is the actual crosshair that is being projected out the autocollimator and then the 90 degree that you see captured between the boxed lines there that's the return image and you do readings by turning the micrometer dial for the uh, offset you see the, the little bridge lines there moving that's what you're lining up with the return image to take a reading and you get that absolutely centered it takes a lot of practice and focus to get repeatable readings within an, a tenth of a arc second but that's what you do and you read the dial in that position when the sled moves and the return image moves a little bit um, you recenter those lines on there take the next reading and that's how that works I forgot to mention that this is a dual axis autocollimator where it can read both vertical and lateral angular motions simultaneously a single axis autocollimator can measure them one at a time by rotating the uh, autocollimator through 90 degrees and then taking your second set of readings for lateral, you can do both, but being able to do both simultaneously is a big time saver. Here is a reading through the vertical seconds micrometer. Right now, that 21 to 22 is from 21 seconds to 22 seconds. So we are reading 0.1 second increments there, so this would be a reading of 21.4 seconds. This is just a cardboard representation of the mirror sled. This is the mirror surface, and the autocollimator is measuring the tilt in this sled as it changes its position. So this would be the first position that you would zero the autocollimator at, so you'd be on zero seconds right here. Then you would move to the next position slide where this foot occupies the exact same spot, which is very important. And you would take your angular reading here. And that angular reading would be the difference between this line and this line, whatever that is in seconds of rise. And you would just carry on down the line with each place measuring what these tilts are back and forth. And once you get them all done, the black line is a straight line drawn between the two endpoints of the run. And as you can see here, this will show us the plus and minus of the highs and lows relative to that straight line. And that can all be trigged out to tell exactly what's going on with that particular line. 
And those lines, each line that we're talking about here when we say a run, is one of these lines that is a particular part of the Union Jack uh, pattern that we use to calibrate the plates. This is the Union Jack pattern that we talk about, named for the Union Jack flag. And the lines are using this nomenclature. So this would be the AC run, this would be the AG run, this would be the AE run, BF run, like that. And that's how you keep track of them when your autocollimator software uh, to measure them or to do your, your uh, manual math, which is pretty tedious. The mirror system and rail system that I've designed is to very efficiently do this with minimal movement of the autocollimator and to have every foot location line up uh, on each corner so that they're all, all there. So that's what we're going to look at today is the uh, construction uh, of making this mirror system. So this is a turning mirror. This isn't your typical turning mirror. Usually they're just a mirror on a round disc. And you get your autocollimator so it's shooting right at the center of the mirror. And then by turning the turning mirror to the right angle, you can get this beam to bounce off of here and go down the axis that you want, in this case down this way. And then without moving the autocollimator, you can change the angle and run down this way. Bounce off of here, run down the straight run, and then also change the angle again and run down and do your runs down the diagonal. So you can do three runs without having to move the autocollimator. The spacing for the feet on the sleds, the distance between the feet that are bearing on the plate, is something that um, can be adjustable if you do all different sizes of plates, but since this is the only plate that I intend to be doing this on, I picked 5.5 inches because it allows a very large area of coverage, meaning for a 36 inch run I can get 33 inches, uh, only three inches short, so the point here would be an inch and a half in from this edge. The 48 uh, line ends up being 44, and that is two inches on each end in from the corner. And then the diagonal turns out to be 55, uh, and that allows all of the points to actually match up, which is a uh, requirement of the federal specification. One thing that a normal turning mirror doesn't do, it doesn't allow you to actually have all of your foot contact points on the plate be the same location with a, within a 0.3 diameter circle. I haven't seen an autocollimator system out there that actually does that properly, and that's what this addresses. But if you go to turn this, what's going to keep this whole thing from just sliding all over the place and losing your location oriented with the autocollimator? And that's where I devised the flags to be able to come down and go in location and the axis of rotation of this is two inches in this direction the long axis of the table and an inch and a half in from this direction so if I go to another corner I may have to flip these and that's what these do these allow the the, the center be, to be uh, either inch and a uh, half or the two inches in from the edge so the technique is to gently load this into the corner and then even when you're turning this you gently load pressing in this direction and it keeps it seated and it doesn't scoot around and you can make your adjustments finally without any problems. The markings on here are the distance from the edge of the plate so that these can be positioned properly. This is for the this edge, this is for the center and then this would be the same from the opposite end. And axial position of the rail is designed to be flush with the edge of the plate so you don't need to measure in that direction. The back of the guide rails have silicone sheet that's bonded on with this silpoxy, which really bonds to the silicone extremely well and to the steel. These pads allow this to, once it's positioned on the plate, to stay put and not skid out of the way as you gently press the uh, side of the sled against the rail. In this first location, you would use your turning mirror to get the image of the crosshair that's bouncing off the sled mirror bouncing off of here bouncing back to the autocollimator that you would turn until you get that image in the autocollimator it, it, you'll be able to actually center up the vertical crosshair centered in the in the in the screen it doesn't matter it just needs to be in the ballpark and here you would zero your autocollimator uh, zero your seconds out to work from there you can see the black inlay here it's a uh, 
carbon black filled epoxy inlays in the rail at the 5.5 spacing such that when you go to move the sled you just move down until the other foot lines up with the uh, the marking and that's how you traverse down so in this location we would take our first reading from zero and that would be recorded and then you would slide down to the next location like thus take your reading and carry on until you've done your entire run. Now we just flip and put our long run bar on at the spacing called for at two and a quarter inch from the edge flush on the far end and now we simply turn the turning mirror from its original position until we get our image to line up bouncing off of the sled in this location till the vertical crosshair shows up roughly centered in the autocollimator and we're ready to do our, our runs. I would be using gloved hands on this for uh, minimizing thermal influences and you, you'll also notice that I don't touch the sled with my hands at all. I push it with a stick. So you would zero the autocollimator at this location and then you would move down to the next location take a reading, move down to the next location, take another reading, and so on, all the way down the whole length and record your readings. And lastly, for this corner mirror position, we would turn the, the mirror until we got our image lined up from the sled in this orientation for the diagonal run. We'd zero the autocollimator, and then we would push down and do our incremental moves, take a reading at this location, take a reading at the next location, down there and so on. There would be a setup where the flags are only down on this edge to hold it at the right location to do the midline runs. Same thing would happen on the, the long run down the middle. And then the mirrors would be placed on the other corners to do the other two sides and then uh, one for the uh, opposite diagonal. And then you're all done. Punch the numbers into the software and you get a flatness chart. These V-blocks were purely for demonstration purposes. I need to make an actual mount for this that sits on the plate to hold the autocollimator at the right height for these uh, instruments to be the same as my Hilger and Watts autocollimator. I only did this as a brief covering of the measuring of a plate so that you had some concept of what these items actually were as I show you how I am uh, machine these and some of the design aspects of it. That's the lap carbide feet on the bottom. This is the preloaded, spring preloaded bearing for the pivot that rotates on three turkite pads. These are the two position flag feet for holding it off the edge of the plate by a certain amount. And they can be out of the way completely. And then this is the differential screw adjuster system for turning that hex head is the equivalent of 440 threads per inch and the inner screw turning it is the equivalent of 44 threads per inch so it allows adjusting the tilt of this mirror to be perpendicular to the base the angle here is to get a full inch and uh, 5 eighths diameter of view at 45 degrees because this is used for shooting the bending the beam that's why it's called a turning mirror because we're, we're actually turning the beam and this allows us to adjust its position to get it lined up with the uh, guide rail of the sled. Here are all the pieces of the turning mirror base. These all have been milled, prepped angle wise, tapped holes. They also have the pockets for the carbide feet. So here's my little carbide slug, and that's been ready to go. So that's, that's captive. This will get silver soldered. And um, this particular piece, if I don't silver solder this first, this is going to oxidize from the uh, heat of the welding and, and turn blue. So I'm going to choose to silver solder the feet in first uh, so that that doesn't cause an issue and then I can weld it and the welding will not get this hot enough to melt the silver solder. One of the important things with carbide when you're silver soldering is to have a nice virgin surface meaning you've used a diamond tool to abrade it. You're not after a smooth like lap surface but you just want a coarse diamond file 
or diamond plate and get the, the surface roughened. You can see all the scratch marks there. That's a nice version. You're getting fresh exposed cobalt and, and binder and tungsten. And the outsides of these are, are very good. The pocket is clean. I'm going to take my black stay still. This is the black high temperature brazing flux. I use it for, for all, all of my silver soldering. And um, this is water based. I'm going to put this in. I'm also, one of the best things you can do for silver soldering is to get the solder in the joint first. I'm going to make a determination of how much silver solder I think volume wise is necessary. I'm deeming this little piece here to be the correct volume that I need and I'm putting that actually right in the bottom taking the piece that I've scuffed up making sure that it's getting wetted all around putting this face down in here and uh, you always if possible you always want a situation with silver soldering where you have the part captive as as good as possible I've got my three-legged gizmo here uh, this can be in ver all different various kinds of forms you've probably seen these before and here this doesn't need much I'll be able to just push down with that with my fingers and I have a little, making sure I have a nice little flux uh, fillet around here. There's all different situations in silver soldering. Uh, number one, you always want to get your heat in the bigger piece first. It's easier to end up with somewhat of a cold joint from heating the small, easier to heat part. You see the silver solder flow on it, but the larger, harder to heat part hasn't really wetted as well as it needs to. So that's why I'm focusing everything down here on the bottom piece where it's, it's really thick. I'm going to dial my, my flame up here a little bit. Silver solder flux turns water clear when it's at temperature. And um, I'm making sure that I'm getting the back heated enough here. Now this is getting up to the point where this will, is going to tend to flow. I've got a chunk of solar solder in there that's actually holding this thing up off the bottom. And once that actually uh, uh, gets up to temperature and flows, you'll see this part drop down and see the, the silver solder come up and whip up around the part. I know from my dimensions that that's actually going deep enough. And I don't quite have enough silver solder in there. I'm going to come over and I'm just going to add a little bit here on the side. So I fill that void. And now I can see I've flowed everywhere. So my guesstimation on my volume of material required there was a little, little shy. So that's it. You let that cool gently. Once it's down, you know, not super hot, you can uh, put that in warm water. Um, and the flux, even though it looks very glassy, does dissolve in warm water. Here's the three feet soldered in. You can see all the discoloration and everything. So I'm going to head over to the glass bead cabinet, get rid of all that. Not trying to be funny here. I really do have this clamped up like this. I will tack this well with the uh, take. I have two one, two, three blocks nesting this down in here. It's sitting off the cable because of the carbide pad by about 30 thousandths. And this is actually cocked up on an angle with this lip pulling down on the two feet on either end. And this is to keep this from scooting backwards down the angle right here. You'd want to scoot back if it didn't have this heel to keep it from going anywhere. This is holding it down plenty snug enough to grind the top of this where the rear fitting here is going to sit. So here we're surface grinding the top of the mirror base and that flat surface is what 
uh, the Turkite pads will ride on. Now we've flipped this over sitting on the face that we just previously ground and we're using a resin bond diamond wheel to grind the three feet until they clean up. And this is also establishing parallelism of those feet to the top surface so that when the mirror spins the plane that it's spinning on is parallel to the surface plate. Sawing the excess off the turning mirror mount in the roll-in saw. Milling the front surface of the block. This will get the recess cut in with the woodruff cutter to hold that mirror in place and have adjustability also. Milling the pocket for the mirror. Then the woodruff cutter for the undercuts that leave the ears hanging over for the set screws. Now we're drilling and tapping the set screw holes that hold the nylon point set screws on this side, but also tap clean through for set screws with spherical points on the back side to hold the location. And then the upper one actually gets a uh, nylon screw from this side, but the differential adjuster from the back side for the very fine adjust. And there we are tapping with some anchor lube. Surface grinding the turkite pads to be flat and true to the rest of the body. Here's the base weldment finished up. Carbide feet silver soldered in and lapped flat. This bearing bore is just a like a gauge fit and I have a stack of light Belleville washers in series so I'm actually just increasing the travel length. I'm not increasing the pressure. And this is what preloads this bearing. The other half of this is three turkite pads on the actual mirror mount that spins. This is a um, quarter inch pull dowel that enabled me to get threads into a nice hardened shaft. I lapped that diameter of that shaft until it was nice gauge fit with the ID of this bearing. So the three turkite pads form a kinematic plane resting on this lap surface here. So that provides our flat trajectory for this thing to spin. Then this goes in and when we put our screw in here and seat this down, this preloads those washers you can see the the bearing scoot down in and start to compress the springs and this tightens onto the actual uh, dowel pin and bottoms out and then that provides this very smooth uniform axis of rotation for when we turn this mirror that's very stable and has very little stick slip because you need to move this in very small increments to get the uh, axis of the autocollimator and it's reflection for whichever way your whichever line of the three lines that we shoot from here uh, to get it lined up. So this needs to be smooth and able to move in very small angular uh, amounts. Making the flags out of 416 stainless, facing off, roughing the first boss on there, two roughing cuts, and come back in here and turn the finish cut, and then face in the finish cut for the face. Groove tool from behind the face for a little neck on there. Chamfer it. Face groove for the O ring. Center drill. Drill. Toolmaker's clamp is a means of getting a, con a repeatable stop with the digital readout for the drill. Parting tool going in to do the groove that leaves the two flag discs on either side. Four cuts in there. Two sides first and then come to the middle. And we'll come back in and do a finish cut on across the bottom. Come in behind so that we can have something to be able to chamfer all those edges. Chamfering all those with a chamfer tool. And then the outside chamfer tool doing the flag edges. And then the parting tool back in. Parting it off and bamboo skewer to hold it. 
three more and we're Hold holding on. the part to a hard stop that I threaded so that it holds it rigidly and I'm also closing the collet firmly on it taking full cuts all but about ten thousandths as I rough this off that's a Pro Max rougher finisher and I'm making sure I'm a little bit on the climb side so that the parts don't uh, suck into the cut just eyeball getting on center when I do the rotation by hand with the indexer I have the stop set for the four locations for the faces but in between is just by by hand roughing it off now I'm coming back and I'm doing a finish cut at the final depth going around each face there it is pillar file file the mill marks off blend in all of the radii to the to the body and then glass bead finish so I have the screw has some blue molly lubricating the screw itself I have some uh, CMD extreme pressure lube on here to assemble this here there we go <clears throat> Then we're going to put a set screw in the back here and lock the one screw against the other to establish the degree of tension that I want on the on the uh, adjuster here. Oh, sorry, that can be a little bit snugger than that. The O-ring gives it a nice drag without being. Okay, I'm going to back off just a little bit from there and then tighten the set screw. Yeah, that's nice. And see, this allows the one flag to be down, or the other flag to be down, or no flags for locating relative to the to the uh, edge of the plate. Show a few of the design aspects that were involved in designing this. One of them was to keep this as thin and light as possible for the ability of it to thermally equalize quickly in an environment so it's not a real huge thick section it'll take forever to uh, get equal temperature because any thermal distortions in this will affect the angle of the mirror and cause inaccuracies another thing I did was to you notice the web here is way thicker than back here and that's to get the actual weight on these feet front and back to be almost identical you'll notice here that when I turn mass properties on I have the center of gravity of this equidistant between the two feet and I just kept messing around with the thickness of this inner web to get it to that point. These four screw holes in the bottom here are for M4 screws socketed screws that can be put in from this side and then the wrench can go through the upper hole will allow this to be bolted to any kind of special shaped master like a V male or female V to ride in a way for checking straightness in two directions so just give us some versatility to be able to be clamped to something. These are nylon tipped screws that just put gentle pressure against the mirror and this one holds it down tight from the top to balance against the this is a central spherical uh, tip screw that it, it pivots on here but then this one provides the vertical tilt adjustment provides the lateral adjustment to get the mirror perpendicular to the planes of these three feet and the bottom two feet. I opted for just a rectangular thin foot because I think it's actually technically better for what a mirror sled does. This gives a very discrete point of measurement rather than a uh, round foot and then a third foot. This allows it to travel and, and get into the places that you'll see in the video of where um, this needs to fit. Here's a section through the differential adjuster. This is a 44 thread per inch uh, inner screw, standard socketed screw with a spherical end ground on. This is 1040 outside threads. So you have the differential between 44 and 40 threads per inch. But the advantage here is when you release this clamp, you can directly tweak at 44 threads per inch for course adjust without running out of any travel uh, and then just lock it and that holds the screw so it cannot rotate and then when you turn the hex section 
it turns the brass and turns the both screw sections together uh, giving you the uh, differential thread and then this flexure part allows this to move that small distance without binding this is just the bare iron uh, filed and sanded and a nice glass bead finish on it and oiled here's that arm that I was slotting part of the differential screw adjustment turning that brass hex gives the equivalent of 440 threads per inch movement two thousandths a little bit more than two thousandths per turn turning the silver hex gives you the equivalent of 40 threads per inch this is to adjust the tilt of the mirror one on this side is for the lateral adjustment of squareness of the mirror you can see the three carbide feet on the side of this same as on the other side for being able to lay on its side or to rest against the straight edge for checking straight edges while they're laying flat on the table. Here you can see the reflection in the lap carbide foot. You can see how the spherical ended pieces ended up just being a nice oval in the end after they're ground and lap. So this piece is made out of gray iron and we've sawed this, milled it here with the face mill. With iron it's important to have a 45 degree or some kind of shallow lead angle here or you can get pretty severe edge chipping where the uh, like a straight walled cutter would push out and, and pop pop pieces of the corner out in the iron because the iron doesn't have hardly any ductility at all so something to be aware of in iron the paper is on the chuck just to allow me to put these things on and off for demonstration purposes without worrying about cleaning the chuck so here our normal squaring procedure sand one side of the of the part that's going to sit down on the chuck on our sanding plate our surface plate with uh, silicon carbide paper tack glued to it so that we sit evenly and aren't rocking on corners touch and clean up our first surface we left three thousandths per face on the material uh, to grind on the milling machine we left that much on there so we grind this face we flip it over obviously stoning with precision ground stones in between every step grind this to thickness we use our digital depth gauge which is super handy obviously I don't have the right extension on here for this uh, measurement but all of these measurements are all done with this just by screwing the right uh, extension on to do the, the various lengths so once we're at this stage we switch to t-block in like this where we sit on a parallel and we simply using the squareness of this face to put the pieces on like this and square this one edge and now this back face and this top is square and we know that's good then we come here and we use a little plastic 45 tool 45 degree tool to set this at 45 like that and then we take the finished surfaces that we have the one edge that's done and we sit on a piece a little piece at the bottom here that's roughly at the center of gravity of the part and the purpose of that is that when we do this and we sit on these surfaces this part if it's sitting on the center of gravity is not leaning and having all this weight pulling and deforming this whole structure to get good squareness so we square this side once we're done with that side then we just flip over we take the magnetic block off we can sit on this face now take it to thickness and then flop down on the other ground face face and grind the other side to thickness so that's how we got to the state we're at so one thing to keep in mind when you're doing a part like this especially where when you remove the actual outer periphery of this part this no longer has any really nice surfaces to sit on as far as uh, orientation and all that. It's, it's doable but um, by using a little forethought and saying okay what can we do while it's in this rectangular state beforehand and we look at it and say okay these bottom details these holes that get drilled here this uh, ball milled groove that goes in here the ball milled grooves on these faces uh, can go through and another reason why it's important uh, thinking beforehand is these holes that we're talking about up on the surface go through and would end up going through an angled surface which would make the drill walk so by drilling these before any of these other operations they're unhampered they'll just go straight through not a problem just make sure we drill deep enough to get through that when we do mill this other the other details on that uh, the hole will be all the way through so always good to think through process wise another one on this is that we have some some work here to do on the face of this which would be in this orientation like this where, where our spindle would be like this so we're not we're going to do this we're going to saw this part out first 
we'll do this detail work right here on this face while we're sitting on this back surface. Then when we're done all that, then we'll go ahead and we'll remove, the, saw the rest of this off and we'll actually profile mill the outside of this thing and do all this pocket work. Ball milling the pockets for the carbide feet on the bottom edge. And then we're doing the sides on both sides. Sawing off the excess in the front so that we can just mill around that profile. And we're using a 3 8 end mill there and just doing the finish cut on that front profile. Now we're standing on end still with the back intact and doing the woodruff cut through there for the mirror mounts. You can see all the other milling we did on there and tapping for the mirror mounting screws and support screws. Now we're going to saw the back off on that line. Now we're mounted up on our pallet and milling the back surface that we just got done doing. Milling off the excess in the back, milling some of the pockets through on the faces. Quarter inch end mill, rougher finisher. Now we're doing the carbide pins, sawing off to length with a diamond cutoff discs. This is how I get the axis lateral dead center so that when I go to do a sphere on here, it's actually going to be pretty close to a sphere. So I'm zero to one on one side here, or at least my clamp here. I'm zeroed on one side. I'm hitting my stop over here on my right hand. I'm going to pivot over here, 180. Okay, come in and touch, same stop, I'm zero there. So I know that I'm laterally. The only way it can happen is if this axis of the spindle here intersects the pivot axis which is what we're after that will generate a true sphere now to get the right end length that I'm going to use on my little adjustable stop I also set this axial position of this so that the the ball is there so I'll be generating a true sphere that will also clean up on the end now I will set my little V block stopped here to match what this stick out is and I can stick each one in and just go to my zero setting where I'm touching the diameter and put a sphere on the end of these. Checking the grind radius and the comparator looks pretty good. Little file work on this. Raise the carbide pins in on the sides and on the bottom. Lock them and uh, put the differential screw adjusters for the mirror on and it's done. Here I've got all the carbide soldered in, all the ends. I've filed off any major uh, fillet of solder, which was minimal, uh, because I put the silver solder in the joint first. And then I'm going to glass bead this to get a uniform finish and get rid of all the oxide and excess silver solder. Glass beading does wonders on removing just the silver solder off of uh, items. Here we're tramming in the bottom before we grind the carbide feet. And I have two one, two, three blocks in there strategically placed to support it. But the magnetic V block in the back is actually holding it on the vertical edge. Here I'm plunge grinding full wheel width moving over, plunging down again, three passes. Of course, we're taking off almost a sixteenth of an inch of carbide. Here I'm doing a traverse pass to get a finish on the carbide pins. So, glass beaded, ground off the excess off the feet, ten thousandths protrusion on all these feet, and uh, Got a nice glass bead finish all over. I'm just going to oil this and leave it as is. I, I kind of like the way it looks. For the finished differential clamps, now you'll see some of the production. Slotting a 20,000 wide slot with a carbide slotting tool, going through an eighth inch thick of uh, cold rolled steel. And um, it actually goes really quick, probably maybe two minutes to slot through that whole thing uh, with a blind slot. Uh, just moving the Bridgeport quill. As you can see here, I'm just the Bridgeport round handle and uh, works really, really nicely. 
I'm using a dowel pin in a toolmaker's clamp with the toolmaker clamp clamped to the sanding table to put the radius on and come up tangent. Here's a larger one doing the opposite end. Makes a really smooth, nice, controllable radius. Just pull them off with the tweezers. You can see it does a really nice job. Pulling the stock out with the stop, setting it to length, turning tool in, facing off, turning the thread diameter and the hex diameter, chamfer tool for the thread, OD thread, threading with a full profile thread tool for 40 threads per inch, right up to the shoulder with the harding. back chamfer for the back of the hex have the toolmakers clamp on there on the drill as a stop for a repeatable Z position with my digital readout drilling the hole letting the tap holder float and let my fingers be the clutch for my thread engagement forward and then reverse to back out part off in the back chamfer on the end and we're done The straight edges are just cold rolled steel and they were pretty straight, but when I checked these before I got ready to use them, this long one was out about 30 thousandths bow. And those marks you see are for me peening that edge of the straight edge to make it expand and make it bow in the direction I needed to go to straighten it out. So I had to do that to all three.